Hello everybody and welcome to this week's edition of Dr. Bonnie Delivers where I share thought-provoking ideas. Sometimes I coach people online around an issue that they want to address um, and tap into almost 30 years experience as a psychologist and about five as a holistic coach. So today's episode is entitled um, Notes from Marian Woodman on her book The Crown of Aging. This is actually a book that I listened to on tape in 2002 and recently came across my notes again and I am absolutely amazed at how prescient she was in terms of foreseeing where we would be 15 years down the road from the time that she did this this audio recording. So if you can think of anyone who might be interested in hearing some thoughts on aging and spirituality and where we're going as a nation, um, feel free to share this, this video with them. Um, I'm Dr. Bonnie Nussbaum, America's kick-ass coach and the owner of Empowerment Coaching. And I help frazzled business owners, entrepreneurs, and others to really get back into enjoying their life and their business again. Um, easy to get overwhelmed. And so my job is to help them get things out of their face so that they can get the bigger perspective on life and um, get back to what's really important. So um, I just want to show you, there's a picture of Mrs. Woodman and she was a very prolific writer uh, about, she was a Jungian analyst <clears throat> and um, the Crown of Age is actually sort of her magnum opus, and she's talking about aging, and I believe this was from after she had had a bout of cancer that really came close to killing her. She's talking in this, this recording about crone energy, uh, so for women moving beyond the, the maiden stage to the, the mother stage to onto the crone stage, and the advantages of, of that, etc. So I just want to share some of the notes from this, but I want to read the description from the back of the, the book so that you kind of have an idea of where we're going. We are each crowned twice in this lifetime, teaches the legendary Jungian analyst Marion Woodman. Much is written about the promise of the first crowning at birth, but what of the second, which comes only after a lifetime of experience? This is the crown of age, she says, a symbol for the culmination of our inner and outer development as human beings. In the crown of age, Woodman examines what it means to pass through life's many crossroads and thresholds, emerging as an elder, the embodiment of wisdom, wholeness, and truth. Mining the riches of her own life, including a battle with cancer that nearly ended it, Woodman illustrates the paradox of growing old. That while our physical strength wanes, our spiritual strength blossoms petal by petal. With poetic insight, she describes the archetypal passage in a woman's life from mother to virgin to crone, and the preparation of our souls for the great crown we receive only when life ends. The crown of age is a crowning achievement in Marion Woodman's long and celebrated career as a writer, teacher, analyst, and trusted elder. So I just want to go over some of the notes and kind of put in my own commentary on this. So one of the first things that caught me that she stated, and she's a very eloquent writer, is the goal is not perfection. The goal is wholeness. And as we're going through some of this stuff, you're going to see that um, her idea of wholeness is that we can't get to being whole until we experience the traumas and suffering of a, a lifetime, and that's what cracks us open to become whole. So, she, she's talking a little bit here about um, things we learned from our parents, and she says, the ego must surrender to the higher power if you are going to find out who you, your soul, without all the claptrap from the parental complexes of your mother and father, once you realize you have come through them, but you are an entity in yourself, then you are on the road to surrender. And the map, of course, are your own dreams. She was very, again, she's an analyst, so she was very 
into what our dreams had to tell us. And there's a point in here where she talks of, well, and actually it's right here, that when we don't pay attention to what comes up in our dreams, when we don't either choose to or know how to mine our dreams for the wealth of information that's trying to come through there, it ends up showing up in other ways. Illness, life events, etc. So wise, very wise. And I've got some wonderful tools for dealing with dreams that are really fun. Um, but she quotes Carl Jung here who said, what is not brought to consciousness comes to us as fate. The gist being, if we're not willing to pay attention to this stuff, it's going to kick us in the ass one way or the other. And if you don't get it into consciousness in your dreams, you will get it in life. Once you see that happening, you must look carefully in the dreams to find out where the new energy is trying to come through. The dream will show you clearly where the new energy wants to be released into consciousness. You have to honor that and follow it. You have to decide if you are going to follow that energy or reject it. Very dangerous, she says, to reject it. Very dangerous to follow it, but it's that balancing that hones the crone energy. So, talking about herself, she was a housewife, and she said, I wanted a conscious destiny, not an unconscious fate. I love that statement. I wanted a conscious destiny, not an unconscious fate. So she went into analysis. And I love, there, there's this quote in there about from her analyst talking to her about the path that she's on. And he says, well, Mrs. Woodman, you're going to go down that road whether you like it or not. You can either go like a squealing pig to slaughter, or you can muster as much grace as is in you and walk. <laughs> so walk she did. She really, um, that was the beginning of her opening herself up to then becoming the analyst she became and sharing all of the, the breadth of knowledge that she gained over the course of her lifetime, including dealing with the cancer. She says, there is a meaning in letting go. Part of that meaning is to simplify. Many of the treasures in your home, you simply have not the physical energy nor the time to work with if you are going to develop your spiritual side. So what she's talking about there is as we get older, we do really need to be culling down the things that exist in our physical world. And interesting to note, the number of people who have descended into hoarding um, because really that's going to block you from becoming fully in touch with your spiritual side. All that stuff that you then have to attend to gets in the way of having the time and the energy to go within and figure out um, your spiritual self. She says, more than that, the energy has gone out of them. She's talking about the, the treasures in your life, in your house. Has gone out of them for you so it becomes boring or hard work doing them. So at that point, I think it's a wonderful idea to say, now who would bring that energy alive? I can't bring it alive, but this is a beautiful object. Who would like it and who would put their energy into bringing it to life? Who could I gift this to? So for instance, my daughter came to visit me this weekend and years ago, I spent a lot of time creating albums, photo albums for them, scrapbooks, heritage albums, etc. And I really poured a lot of my heart and soul into those. And it felt to me like the energy had gone out of those books for me. So I offered them to my daughter and she took them. So I think she can now choose to put her energy into them and make them much better than where they're at right now. And it opened up space in my world to bring in something else that may be better serving where I'm at at this point. She says, simplify your outside life so that you are finding the reality that matters and all that is unessential goes. <laughs> It is also important to simplify your relationships. If you have relationships that have no energy in them, 
you have not time for them and that's hard. Because sometimes you've known people all your life. But simplifying is essential because the physical strength goes. Where you used to be able to pull on your resources and say, oh, I can do this and I can do all these things, you no longer can. It's as simple as that. And I think about a particular friend of mine who still burns the candle at both ends and in the middle and often ends up sick. And I don't think is quite seeing yet the connection between her physical body not being able to keep up with that kind of choice of lifestyle anymore. So she says, you want your resources for your strength, and your strength now is your spiritual strength. And your re responsibility now is to your spiritual strength. This is the crowning of your life. You are now coming into the blossoming of your soul and presence. A real crone who is in presence changes the atmosphere of the entire room. Don't you guys notice that? When, you walk, when someone walks into a room and she just has a presence about her. You can tell there's great wisdom, there's great depth. She may not say a whole lot. Oftentimes I have found the, the spiritual teachers, the ones who are the wisest, say very little. Their energy carries their message or they will share what is needed to be shared and no more. As opposed to the person who goes on and on and on and on. Still waters run deep. Um, then she talks about the, the, the power of a crone. The crone is that energy that has come to a place of no power and therefore she can be trusted. At that point in our lives, we're kind of letting go of all of the things that, um, gave us power, quote unquote, jobs, status, degrees, all that stuff. She says, if you want to get good advice, go to somebody who has no investment in power and she will tell you the truth. And it may hurt terribly, but afterwards you will say thank you because you know it is the thing that can release you from your own illusions. And that's the power of crondom. It will release you from the illusions that are crippling you. It is like carving off what is not essential and coming into essence. So she talks about um, the soul is the divine part of us that is embodied while we're here on earth. And there's a huge difference between being an embodied person and unconscious flesh. And if you look around now, I see a whole lot of people living unexamined lives, going from day to day, not really looking at, not really being conscious of why they're making the choices they're making, Maybe not making choices, letting things happen by default. Um, and she's talking about the embodied person being that very mindful kind of person who's really paying attention to their earth walk. She says, the coming together of soul and spirit is the microcosm of the macrocosm that we call God. The masculine is the spirit. The feminine is the matter, and those two are essential to each other. She talks in other, other books about the masculine, divine masculine, and divine feminine within, and that all of us, regardless of our external gender, have both within us and need to have a balance. It's that yin-yang thing. You need the balance of both. And in America... In the past hundred years, we have vastly overvalued the masculine and denigrated the feminine. So I think we're moving into a period of time where we're beginning to see more of the feminine rising up again and getting integrated with that masculine. There's a beautiful quote in here from Herschel, whom she's, she describes as a very wonderful Jewish rabbi. And he said, spirit without matter is ghost. And matter without spirit is corpse. And I think we have a whole lot of walking corpses. I think that's why the rise of all the zombie shows. Really what it's trying to show you is what happens to people when they lose their spirit. When they have their flesh, but they're not developing their divine self. 
in the in the process my friend Kayleen talks about living fully human and fully divine we want both we need both um, let's see she says if spirit does not penetrate matter there's not going to be any great dance the great dance of life she then gives an example which I love because I'm a writer and I'm planning on sharing this with my next writers retreat which I think is going to be in March um, Think of yourself writing. You can fumble along trying to perfect your style, but until you are being written, there is not much happening. And many, many writers, and I know this for myself, you get into that flow, words are coming through, they're eloquent, you look back on the stuff and you go, really? That came through my pen or my fingers on the keyboard? It, it's pretty amazing. When matter, this is an interesting point, she's talking about addictions here. When matter becomes impossible for people, when they can't deal with life, what better escape than through spirit? If you have genuine spirit, good enough. But if your escape is alcohol or other substances, you're in trouble because your spirit then, get, your soul gets projected onto that substance. So let's talk about that a little bit. I do think life has gotten to be very difficult for many people to live. It's so pressured, it's so painful, and they don't have that connection to spirit which creates the vessel that helps hold all of those painful events. So they can't deal with life and they do escape into, for myself recently I've been working on the, because I've been escaping too much into spirit meaning not living in my earth body as much. It's much more fun to be playing around with the angels than it is being in this body when things get difficult. So I have had to work on the grounding stuff. But again, she's talking about people escaping into other spirits, alcohol, pot, whatever substance is your substance of choice, gambling, I don't care, whatever it is. Then you're in trouble because your soul gets projected onto that substance. And you've seen people sell out their soul for those substances. She's talking about a death wish here. There's a death wish, wish in our culture which is showing up in the rampant addictions and rampant autoimmune breakdown diseases. She's talking about lupus, chronic fatigue, cancer, AIDS. Psychoneuroimmunology now knows that the images you take in change into chemistry in your body. The neuropeptides can actually shift the chemistry of your body when those images come in. So listen to this next line. I just think this is so powerful. So that the images we eat, quote unquote, are as important as the food we eat. What are we exposing ourselves to? I remember way back when, when before my kids were born, um, I had a sister-in-law who had a little boy, and he was little, maybe a year and a half old. She puts this video in, and he's watching it, and she said offhand, this is his favorite movie. It was blood and guts and gore, and I'm like, oh my God, what is this kid soaking up? what's coming into his system, what are the images coming into his system, and how is that changing who he is and who he's going to be? All of the autoimmune things that are going on in the world, if you look at that, basically what it is is a rejection of self, a rejection of the body. And she asks the question, why would a body reject itself? Why would it refuse to play host to the soul? interesting questions um, she talks about the immune system carrying the integrity of the body and the soul and she says I think of the crown of life as holding energy knowing it is reality not having to please anybody I'm sure you guys have heard that that um, saying about a woman once she turns 50 you know she just is she's not gonna put up with a bunch of crap anymore not having to please anybody, speaking your own truth, and knowing the presence is coming from the mystery that you honor. You cannot explain it. You wouldn't be foolish enough to attempt it. But you recognize a wholeness in yourself 
that radiates through the cells of your body out to other people. Now these are the people who are becoming actualized, who are living this mindful life. Certainly there's a whole lot of people who are just getting old. They're not becoming elders. They're not becoming wise leaders. They're just getting old. She says, um, so whatever illness comes in old age or whatever age, if it can be looked upon as a transformative experience, an initiation that takes you into the very depths of darkness, then allows you to come back with the light that you find in that darkness. And when you come back through the tunnel, back into life, and you know that you are carrying a treasure that was unknown to you, impossible for you to attain without having gone into the depths of that darkness. I love that. I think a lot about children who have cancer. And I have a friend who actually was uh, is a cancer survivor. He's actually one of the longest cancer survivors in Wisconsin post um, stem cell transplant. And he talks about that be the cancer and going through that being an tr incredibly transformative experience in his life. Um, she says... It can be illness that takes you there. The loss of a partner, the loss of someone you love very much, the loss of your job. Whatever it is that takes you to the deepest part of your own knowing. And again, that darkness ain't fun to get through. But what she's saying and what I believe is it's an integral part of becoming who we're meant to be. You take the butterfly out of the chrysalis, you destroy the potential for that butterfly to be all that it could be. It has to go through that struggle in order to become what it's supposed to be. Same for us. Our earth walk contains a lot of struggles, but those struggles are integral to us becoming who we're supposed to be. She says, how do you get to crondom? I tell you, I think you go through suffering that opens your heart to love. That suffering cracks your heart open. Now, <clears throat> I'll talk about that in a little bit, but again, this is 2002, and I want you to listen to this next part because now this is all the rage. This is what everybody's talking about, but she's already predicting it. We are moving into a planetary consciousness. Again, how prescient is she here? She's predicting this future, but we have no idea how to do it. How are we ever going to come to a planetary consciousness if our hearts are not broken open? I'm suggesting the heart has to be broken open through the suffering, and that's where the crone energy really starts to move. So my thought on that is, how many people spend the rest of their life lamenting the wounds that they experienced? I mean, as a psychologist, I had people who came in and rattled off the list of things that happened to them kind of carrying them as a badge of honor. What this is suggesting is you take that as grist for your mill, you realize that those events were designed to crack open your heart so that you can step into this, this much deeper wisdom, but you can let go of the events. The events that created that crack in your heart are not what's important they merely serve the purpose of creating the crack, if you want to look at it that way. And here she's starting to talk about something I just think is fascinating. She says, To me, there's a huge difference between healing and curing. Medical science can cure you by using methods that will make your body well. But if you have not come to wholeness in that process, you are not healed. Healing means wholeness, and if the cause of the illness is your soul is in exile, crying out, I want to be included, and there's a new path here, then it will manifest in another place. So what she's saying there is, healing really needs to be holistic, mind, body, spirit. We've spent way too much time focused on the body and chemicals and what we can, surgeries and what we can fix. And, and have paid short shrift to the mind and the spirit in the process of, of healing. So she's saying, 
healing process is certainly crucial to growth. Excuse me there. So, she says, in other words, there's a whole new body after an illness or after suffering. She calls it the light body, the energy body, the subtle body that came to birth out of the suffering of that embodied soul. And you can see people who carry that very well. They go through whatever trauma they go through <clears throat> and they come out the other side with this wisdom and depth that um, she's calling the light body. Um, let's see. Here we go with the change stuff again. And how many people do you know who really resist change? She says, you're going to go through thresholds in your life where one part of your life is finished, dead. Your energy has gone out of it. You have to make the sacrifice to leave it. That's very important. Conscious sacrifice has to be made at each one of these thresholds. In other words, to move to a new place, you've got to sacrifice the part of your life that held you in the past and it's got to be done consciously. Otherwise, you lug your baggage along with you. So in other words, again, you can carry your wounds forward in life or you can glean what you're supposed to get out of those wounds, set those wounds aside and move forward. The people that you see doing relationship after relationship after relationship with the same kind of issues, they haven't taken the message out of those woundings to be able to make a change and do something different. Job after job, people who repeatedly lose jobs. Again, there's, there's learning there that they're not taking in and using. She talks about one way to address some of this stuff, one way to drop yourself into a deeper evaluation of what's going on in your life, being mindful of what your life experiences are trying to teach you. She says, journaling is a mirror of your soul. When you have nobody to talk to and you are strong enough not to talk to anybody, when you are trying to figure out who you in your virgin soul are without contamination by anybody lifting their eyebrows at that strange dream you've had. And I've seen that at my Tuesday morning breakfast group. Oftentimes people will have very deep things to share and there may be a hesitance here and there because they're concerned about how other people are going to react. For the most part, the breakfast group has been fabulous at holding a big space for people to be working through these kinds of things. She talks about whatever is creative fire for you, that is your container. We all need a container that will mirror us if we are going to come to consciousness. Because you are living the dream if you do not bring it to consciousness. So again, in our subconscious mind, at night, when we don't have all the governors in place or all the distractions, things can begin to pop through and they show up in dreams and they show up, sometimes it's pretty literal, oftentimes it's encoded and you need ways to decode those dreams. And again, I have a really cool tool for that that I love sharing with people. Um, but she's saying if you're not paying attention to those dream messages, it's going to show up in, in your life. She says, look at the energy that you're losing if it's projected out. Some people just project all over the place and they are wildly empty. Projection means you take something that's within you and you dump it out onto somebody else and you hate it or get irritated by it in someone else when really it's a reflection of what's going on in you. So my rule of thumb with that is if there's something about someone else that irritates you, take a look at what that's reflecting within you. Sometimes it's so close you can't even see it. But if you share it with someone you trust, they'll nail it right off the bat. Well, yeah, that's how that's reflected in you. Um, she says, an addict is just wildly, crazily, fiercely empty because they project their best energy out 
and they expect something out there to take care of them, but they are also compulsively bound to it. To go to the symbolic heart of the projection is to consciously bring that energy into who you are. So she talks about the ego as acting as that container. Otherwise, if the energy coming in from the unconscious is powerful enough, too powerful, and the ego is not strong enough, it'll just blow the ego to pieces, and that's what we call a psychotic break. If someone has a psychotic episode, their ego wasn't strong enough to hold what was coming up unconsciously. So this is a balance between the ego and the energy coming in from the unconscious. Your psyche will hold that balance so long as you don't push or pull it. You just have to trust that. The word that I like to use in that regard is allow. You're, you're merely going to allow. And for many of us, especially if we're doers, that's really hard to step into a place of allowing. We feel like we have to make something happen. <laughs> She says, we are not alone in this process, and once you know that in the cells of your body, you can watch life unfolding without terror. If you believe there is meaning in this somewhere, nature and spirit are a lot stronger than our stupidity, then you can trust. If you believe there is meaning in the universe, there is order, then that trust makes the container strong. So we've kind of been talking about that on some of the, the morning the early morning intuitive guidance that I've been doing where it may not make much sense what's going on in your life at the moment it's happening. You may not be able to see where you're putting your foot next on your life path, but hindsight will make you go, aha, okay, now that makes sense. It's having the faith and the trust to keep walking even though you're unsure what the purpose is at that point in time. And I know, much easier said than done. So as you are working toward this conscious aging, you are building your ego, knowing that at some point you are going to surrender it. And there's the paradox. You find your life in order to lose it. As I see the people who age most successfully, they are very egoless. They let go of all of that stuff. It's not about... Um, keeping score, who they have to impress, how much money they have, um, how much power they have, all that stuff kind of goes by the wayside at that point in time. There's a quote here from Jung, which I really like. Where your fear is, that is your task. Where your fear is, that is your task. Most of us head the other direction when there's something that we have fear about. Versus engaging that fear so that we can learn what's there for us. I love hearing about people, you know, the, the biggest fear people have is public speaking. And I love hearing about people who went from, and I was one of them, the person who was holding onto the podium in high school trying not to fall over, um, tackling that and being able to overcome those kinds of fears. There's a ton of personal growth in conquering the fears that you have. Let's see. So here are some <laughs> true crone comments that are coming from Marion Woodman, and I love this. Without the imagination, life is just plain boring. It's not worth living if it's just getting enough money to put bread and butter on the table and have a good screw on Saturday night and all that. It's just not. <laughs> How blunt is that? It's the imagination that's feeding through and keeping us in touch with our own transformative process. And conscious aging is that. You are never bored because the transformative process is continually ongoing. Your body has its limitations, yes. You have to accept that. But your imagination can be more on fire than it ever was. And you have more faith in it. You have more meditative time. Gradually you can turn it around so that you begin to realize that the energy that is in it, even if it's dark energy, is carrying an immense energy that you need in your psyche. You need all the energy that's available in your psyche, and if part of that is fragmented off in some kind of a complex, avoiding something, whatever, your task is to bring it in and use it creatively. She says, I do not believe in pushing the unconscious. 
There is usually a very good reason for the speed it's moving. So again, that's the allowing thing. Honoring the pace with which things are unfolding. She says, you can quietly, not fighting, just stand and say, this is my truth, this is who I am, and I will not be argued with. And she says, and if you've got a joke to throw in, throw it in. There's a quote here from Elliot. A condition of complete simplicity costing not less than everything. So basically what she's saying is this aging process. You give this process all you've got, then the question may come up for you, what's the point? And I think a lot of us get to that point more than once in life. What is the point? Why am I banging my head on this wall? Why am I attending to this? And she said, I would ask you, do you have an alternative? <laughs> Did you ever have any alternative once you were on this path? And I go back to the comment of her analyst. Well, Mrs. Woodman, you're going to go down that road whether you like it or not. You can either go like a squealing pig to slaughter, or you can muster as much grace as is in you and walk. So, here is her ending comment, and I just think this is such a, a beautiful way to, to end this and to send us off. May crondom be a time of crowning for you. May you find your own inner marriage. May your soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. So, I hope you enjoyed the review of the book. Definitely check out her stuff. It's W-O-O-D-M-A-N, Woodman, Marian Woodman. And, um... I'd love to hear your comments on some of the things that, that I shared. And I would also, again, like to put a pitch out there for some of you who might be considering doing the live video with me where you bring <clears throat> an issue that you'd like us to address and we spend about a half an hour on Facebook Live working with that issue using some of the tools that she's talking about here. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please feel free to um, either private message me on this page or you can send me an email at bonnie at empowerment and purpose, all little letters all together, dot com. So that's it for this round of Dr. Bonnie Delivers. I hope you've enjoyed it. And remember, you're capable of far more than you think you are. <laughs>